Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the Sister Girls Book Club, our interview and our podcast, because we're merging. We're going to have our interviews. Some of our interviews will be live where people can see them on YouTube and then also hear them. So I'm happy that Shanae Watkins, author Shanae Watkins, is now here with us. It has been a long time coming. We just had a brief technical difficulty, but we're back. Um, And I'm so excited to have you. So you've written your first book from girlhood to womanhood. Before we get into that, let people know how you were first introduced to the world. So I was introduced to the world uh, on a documentary called Girlhood. It was released out in 2003. Um, It was like a four year long journey of myself along with another young lady um, about our lives in the juvenile justice department. um, Sort of some backstory about how we got there in the first place, our relationships with our family and our support systems, as well as uh, a little recording after we uh, were released. Okay. So, all right. So I watched the documentary at this point more than once, and I've even shared it with my um, scholars at the Junior Scholars Program. And when I watched it in my early 20s, I was just like, oh my God, this this documentary is so deep. It's so good. We've always looked at all of these like young men, but they never shed light on the young black girls. And now we're finally here. It's so moving. And then when I watched it a little older, I was just like, uh uh-uh. uh. It was so many things that I was just like, but they didn't go to the backstory on this. We didn't get to see like how so much happened so early. So now mm-hmm. as an adult on your end watching, because that was just me watching it twice, two different times in my life, right? In my right. 20s and then in my 30s. Um, in my early 20s, actually, and then in my 30s. And then I was just like, hmm. So for you watching it, one probably watching it when you were younger and then watching it as an adult, do you feel like there were any missteps? Oh man. So for me, I just watched it again last night and for years, cause this documentary has been out for 19 years at this point. Mm-hmm. Um, I got to a point where I hated to watch it mm-hmm. because I had gone to all these premieres um, and I had seen it so many times and I was kind of numb to it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, definitely once I, it was a difference between watching it then and watching it now. And when I watched it last night, I was just like, Lord have mercy. It was almost like, I, I noticed that I said a lot of things and I described a lot of what I had been through in life with absolutely no emotion. Mm-hmm. Um, and you would think that in those situations, the adults in those situations probably should have dug a little deeper into mm-hmm. what was all of that. Um, so that's the one thing it was like dang nobody pulled me to the side I was like listen baby how this happened to you and that's what I was and I just felt like the whole time I was just like how is this possible because Mm -hmm. I don't want to give away too much of your book from girlhood to to womanhood but I have just the snippets it was just like you were kidnapped as a baby that was the first I mean from even the the earliest moments of your life was already just so traumatic for your mom and then of course of you because I'm just like even growing up knowing that happened it's just like it's a person still out there like what's going on like your safety then you get molested in like the early grade school and my if I'm wrong about anything just stop me and then from there you get gang raped before you're like 12th birthday then at, yeah. and then at 12 you have an incident where you get into a situation and then somebody ends up losing their life right and then yeah. you go into the juvenile system, the court system, and everybody just has you up until a certain point. And so I'm just like, this is all happening. And then of course, I'm looking at my life in parallel. So I'm just like, at 11, I was watching DuckTales. I was, you know, it's just so many things that I think about. And I'm just like, you had lived so much, but not in a, like a way where it's just like, oh, she lived, girl. She lived a great life. It was like, it was so much trauma. Do you think about it now as an adult and you think that that you had two different lives or do you have like a dissociation or does it feel like one whole life for you? No, it literally feels like two different lives. Um, Watching the documentary was hard last night, um, but writing the book was, it, it was, it was traumatic for me because so many of those things I had even forgotten about like so many of those things were coming to my mind as I was writing I literally spent 30 days just crying and praying and you know leaning on God leaning on my boyfriend um just sitting in one spot just trying to get it out um 
so yeah, no, it definitely feels like a different life. And sometimes I have to go back there, especially to heal some of those old wounds and traumas, because even though it seems like it was two different people it, that like, sometimes it doesn't even seem like that was me, but the aftershock of it, the effects of that life definitely lingered for some time. Mm -hmm. So in order to go back and heal some of those things, you know, I have to kind of bring them together, but it does, it seems like two totally different lives. I can't, I have, I have daughters who are um, 17 and 19 now. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine. I used to look at them at 11 and 12 and say, Jesus, you know, if, if, if I had to sleep for two and three weeks without knowing where you are, just knowing you're wandering the streets somewhere, just doing whatever, I, I would probably lose my mind. I can't imagine what my parents went through. Yeah. So when I watch the documentary, right, that's the only snippet of your parents that we see. We see your mom, we see your dad. But then in the book, we get a whole lot more context on your relationship with your mother and your relationship with your father. And mm -hmm. the like, it was like, and it's so hard to say, it was trauma for you as a child. But also when I read it, it feels like a regular Black upbringing when you are in a home, especially when you did things. Because in my mind growing up, it's like, well, she did that, you know, she did her to be disciplined. And in the Black communities, especially like we've just been raised, discipline typically would involve you getting your behind beat, right? And so, <laughs> and then when you explained it, you expressed it so well, you were just like, at cer certain points, it's not just about, you know, when you're trying to discipline me, you're bringing more hurt because now it feels like you're taking out so much aggression. The parent is mad that they're having to discipline you, mad that they might have to leave work, mad at their own circumstance that you don't even know about as, an, as a child. And that mm -hmm. aggression is all getting taken out when you're getting hit. So nothing really is resolved. It's like, you just beat them for doing something wrong. And you said it yourself, the beatings weren't working, right? It was like, okay, you beat me. And then I would just run away. So mm -hmm. how has that helped you or not helped you, but kind of like guided you when you have your own, now that you have your own children, if you can speak on that. Uh, you know, one of my favorite sayings when it comes to corporal punishment and physical discipline is that, or anything when it comes to parenting, really, you can't plant an apple seed and expect an orange to grow. Mm hmm so a lot of times when people use uh, physical punishment, it's more out of frustration than anything because you don't know what else to do with that child. And those are the only tools that were provided for you um, for child rearing. But a lot of times if we look at our children and some of the things that they do that make us upset enough to put our hands on them, a lot of those things are things that we've taught them, circumstances mm -hmm. that we've put them in, mm -hmm. you know? So for me, I knew from the beginning, I was not going to physically di discipline my children. Mm -hmm. um, I think I did once or twice when they were younger. And then I saw my oldest daughter flinch for me and she was very young. Mm -hmm. She may have been like two or three years old. I was like, mm -hmm. yeah, this isn't the life for us. So yeah. I limited and I gave them grace. I thought about the type of parent that I was because I mm -hmm. wasn't a perfect parent. You know, I tried as much as I could, but I knew that I had them young. I had them while I was still in my trauma. So for instance, we went through a certain period of time um, where I just didn't clean the house when they were young. I just didn't clean very much mm -hmm. um, because I was depressed. I was going through my own thing, right? Mm -hmm. So once I came out of that depression, what parents will normally do, once they get onto something, they automatically expect their children to fall in line. No, I have to have grace for them. You know, I can't be upset about the fact that you don't know how to clean if I didn't show you, you know? so. That's more my parenting style. My parenting style is when, and now don't get me wrong, sometimes I have to get in there behind. But <laughs> yeah, sometimes I have to get in there behind because sometimes it's like, look, I know now, I know I taught you this, so I gave you enough grace mm -hmm. to get yourself together with this. Um, but I look at who I am as a parent first, and then I look at their behavior, and then we try to find a good way to um, figure that out. And I will say, like I said, they are um, 16, 17, and 19. And they do not, they, for the most of their lives, they've never really done anything that requires any type of um, harsh punishment. They do not disrespect me. They're not out in the street selling drugs mm -hmm. or anything like that. They're working, they're in college, um, mm -hmm. and we got there without having to beat it out of them. Right. I, I feel you because um, I watch you from afar and I'm just like, he has own baby. They look just, especially one of them look like your twin. I was just mm -hmm. like, whoa. That is wild. So it's so great to hear that, you know, I felt like a lot of things were just taught. So it was just like, 
our parents really just didn't have the information, right? They were just taught, but they were taught, their parents taught them, and it kind of just kept on going. So one of the things I wanted to know was what inspired you to write the book? Like we're so many years away from the documentary, away from you being 12 years old. You just celebrated a birthday. So I'm just like, what was the thing that said, you know what, I'm going to sit down now. It's time for me to actually tell my story. I know when you read the book at certain points, I'm like, well, she had no time to write no book because she was dealing with some heavy stuff. But what mm-hmm. gave the moment to say, you know what, I'm going to tell it my way and not hire like a ghostwriter or go to somebody and just kind of give them your information to tell them like to put it into a movie or do something else. But you said, I'm going to take this time and do it myself. So I had wanted to do it for a couple of years and people would always approach me. This is actually my third attempt to write this book. Um, And from the very beginning, I knew I wanted to write it in my early 20s because I felt like girlhood didn't tell the story really from my perspective. There was so much filming of myself and of Megan. There were so many times where Megan got it right. There were so many times where I got it wrong. You know, there were times where we were filming and my, I was what, 15 or so, my 21, 22 year old boyfriend was sitting on the other couch. Those are things that they didn't show. And I felt like it did a disservice to all of the people who were inspired by my story if they didn't know the whole story um so I always wanted to do it but what I found myself getting into was that one I I was afraid of how people would look at me if I told if I really spoke about what my life was like when it came to my parents Because the very first thing that people say when they talk about the documentary, when they talk about my parents is, oh, you just, oh, you were so lucky. You just, you, they they were so supportive of you. You guys have the best relationship. I wish I had that. Um, And I was like, shoot, you know, like people are really loyal to uh, the story that they have. And I worried about how people were going to accept me um, if I told what my truth was. But over time, I was just like, you know what? I have to tell it for me. And I tried to do it a time or two. But what I realized is that when you do things with people, sometimes they already have their own perception in their mind of how they want it. And if they're a writer, oh, I already know how you should, your book cover should look like this. And we should have this budget and we should have that. I had the last time that I tried to do it and I did it with someone else and and no disrespect to her or the people who tried, um, there was something like a $10,000 budget for something that I did, but maybe $200, you know, like, so it's just like, uh, no, I would rather just do it on my own, but I knew the story needed to be told. Um, you know, I went to therapy for so long and I honestly feel like when you get to tell your own story in its entirety, the way that you want to, without anybody, um, putting their two cents and it's freeing, Mm -hmm. you know, I wrote those, I wrote that story um, and I left a lot of that trauma right there on the pages and Mm -hmm. went ahead with my life. Did you let your children read it? Have you let them read it yet? Or did they, were they interested in reading it? Mm -hmm. Yep. I let them read it. I'm not sure if they finished um, just because I talked to them so much and Mm -hmm. I'm one of those parents where I am quite candid with them. You know, like I, I'm an open book with them um, because I don't want you guys to feel like when I give you advice that I'm giving it from a place where I haven't been where you are or whatever. Um, so yeah, they've, they've seen the documentary quite a few times. I've been to their classrooms and their schools to speak. <laughs> they've, they've traveled with me when I've gone places to speak and everything. That's so good. So when I look at the book, when I look at you and your life flourishing, when I look at just how everything had to flow the Mm -hmm. big thing i wanted to know is have you forgiven yourself and not just for the incident with the young you know with the the young girl but i'm talking about the a lot of the stuff because even you you with your relationship with your mom you know Mm because she passed away if you watch the documentary you know that's we're not getting nothing giving nothing away out the book she passed yeah. away but you were really young and she was really young uh when mm-hmm. i watched it, I was like, your mom was in her early third like she was young she was, was a baby yes i was just like wow um and like i said when i watched it the first time i didn't get I, she she looked like a grown woman to me but i was mm-hmm. young so and i was just thinking i'm like well after all of this when you watch it and you know that you had even after the documentary um, one of the things that stuck out, it was almost like when you watch it, when I watch it now, even being like, interested in film and stuff, writing myself, 
it was somebody who was a villain and somebody who was like the superhero. Yeah. Megan was more of the villain. And you mm-hmm. were more of like this furry tell girl, like, yes, we can just get it right with her. We're going to pour everything into her. But it kind of abruptly ended. It gave like this ending, like, okay, you're going to community college. And it kind of let our imagination just run, right? Mm-hmm. We didn't know even when you were going to the premiere of these documentaries that you were still going through some stuff, right? Yeah. Um, so I'm just thinking like when you think of it all and some people will be like well that was self-imposed or it was because it is some people might even throw out karma so for your whole time like I said even reading your, when I read your book it was just always this thing of like you question like did I deserve this or you know yeah. something in your life so have you forgiven yourself for just all of it I'm still working on that you know um even speaking on the situation with the other young lady that was hard for me Mm -hmm. just telling that story Mm -hmm. because most people when you see the documentary you don't know what actually happened yeah you know I'm kind of vague about it um but if you look up the stories it'll basically just say that I stabbed her you know over Mm -hmm. a boy which wasn't true yeah um so yeah no I'm 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 still working on that. It, it, it's tough to think because she was a she was a baby, you know. Mm-hmm. When I my children started to get to eleven and twelve years old, um, I just look at them too, you know, and that in that way too, you know, just like what if somebody took my child from here, you know? But I feel like it was important to speak about because, um, I feel like both of our our portions were cautionary tales Mm -hmm. for young women especially as they grow increasingly violent Mm -hmm. but overall you know when it comes to my mother um those are two things that I can't take back Mm -hmm. there's nothing in the world I can do to take those back um so yeah no I'm still working on that I'm actively in therapy working on both situations and I did for a long time feel like you know a lot of what I went through was karma um but I had to look at it and in, in, in the thought process of this has been going on since I was born, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, with the getting kidnapped, getting yeah. hit by a car, like it just, it, it, you know, it's been going on since I was born. So yeah, it's, it's taking some work on that. So even you say you're going to therapy in your times of like despair, or even when you got down on yourself, cause I'm like, you still had, you in your thirties. So you made it, you know, through some of those hard moments, 12, 13, 14, like even the times when you were like, when you first realized you got pregnant, it was still just like, it was a lot of stress. It wasn't just like, oh my God, everybody's celebrating. So how did you find joyful moments? Cause this happened so much in your youth. Right. And yeah. then continue to like say, you know, I'm going to have a happy birthday. I'm going to celebrate New Year's. I'm going to celebrate, you know, just I'm going to laugh at a joke. You know what I mean? And really mm-hmm. mean it and not feel like, you know, I don't know, like, like I, got, I can't laugh. You know what I mean? Yeah. Or I can't do certain things. So how, have you gotten to that point or what does that look like? Because I think that as Black people, we talk about, you know, we don't want to put people in institutions. We don't do that. But sometimes when things happen, like if someone does something bad, and I'm gonna say in this situation, a bad thing occurred, you stab yeah. somebody, even though you didn't intend for them to die, they died, right? Yeah. But it's mm-hmm. just like, so how do we, once you come out of that system and you're now still young, what do we, do we embrace you back into the community? Is it like, do we still shun you? Do what, do you just walk around like, hey, I'm just a, I'm, I'm a regular girl now, I'm free. I did my time, I, you know, I did the time, paid the, like yeah, I did everything. And yeah. how do you like you move, move through life with that like how has it been in both aspects of in having joy and then also like when you tell your story publicly like having people not be like mm, I don't know if I want to talk to her now you know what I mean mm-hmm. um so fortunately I have received very I've received some backlash um especially when it comes to like um uh, when they used to have the old forums for the newspapers and stuff like that, mm-hmm. um, you know, I, I, I will receive a lot of backlash there, but generally face to face or in this new age of social media where people have gotten to see who I am and gotten to see my mm-hmm. personality, mm-hmm. Um, normally people just they understand that that wasn't my intention. Mm-hmm. So they tend to embrace me a bit more. Mm-hmm. Um but yeah, I mean, it was it was it was hard just coming home, just wondering how things were going to be. You know, I wondered if I was going to run into people who had an issue with mm-hmm. me. 
um, I went to a school on a whole nother side of town just so I didn't have to, you know, run into people who was potentially in the midst of all of that. Um, and that was hard. But I think the hardest part is just really having to live with it myself. Mm-hmm. Because I didn't really, emotionally, I didn't really have time to process it. You know, as soon as I came home, things just started happening. and yeah. It was just a lot going on. So I didn't really have enough time to process it or really look at it in a certain way until I was a bit older. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. when now when you go around, you talk to young kids and you're like, you're doing the work to give back to like the community, kind of be like, yo, this ain't that cool. Like, I know social media might look like being a gangster and being hard, is it? Or you yeah. got to but it has its ramifications. You don't leave without consequences, even if it doesn't catch up to you in that one instance. What has people's, like, especially young people's reception been like towards you? Because now you're not the cool kid. You're like an adult. Yeah. And when you're talking to them, they're like, all right, I get it, but you don't understand my life and blah, 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 blah. Do you see yourself in like a lot of these young people? And like, what, yeah. is, what is your message to them? I'm always the cool auntie like or, or the, I, I'm always the cool auntie or the cool um mama you know my my kids I'm always taking in some other children or something and they mm-hmm. listen especially those who know my backstory mm-hmm. now for instance when I'm in school right now to expand on my business and um there's some young girls in my class so sometimes when they talk and I try to give them advice because they don't know who I am they don't know my yeah. background and be like girl yeah I don't want to hear that I don't want to hear that because I know everything. I, I literally just told one young lady earlier today, they were talking about uh, fighting other women because of men. And I was like, baby, listen, mm-hmm. you will be somewhere in jail and mm-hmm. lost your license to, you know, after we just spent all this money for school and he will still be with her. Just chill. And she was like, mm-mm, because I, and I, I was like, all right, well, you know, I kind of let, I don't talk to brick walls because I understand I used to be a brick wall, mm-hmm. you know, and I feel like in a lot of these kids, um, all you can do is lay a foundation. So if I do say something, I'm not even expecting it to have that effect right then and there. Mm-hmm. It might be a couple of years, 10, 15 years down the line and they say, oh gosh, you know, I remember mm-hmm. they told me X, Y, Z. So it's cool. I feel it. So back to the book, what was the process like of you picking up the pen and really like from the first page, I was like, what the hell? We didn't even like have a, like a open, it was like, right, boom, the open, it was like I kidnapped when I was a kid, like a baby. So like, how does that happen yeah, to anybody? I, I was just like, wait, what? From like, it just felt like, now I, I just felt like that don't happen in the hood. Like we don't get kicked, like, you know, in that, in that way that like you got kidnapped, yeah, like yeah. You kidnapped, obviously. I don't want people to be like, no black people, we know. Um, black girls are still missing and we're still looking for, but it just seemed like the way it happened, it was just very much like, how in the world did that happen over there? You know, mm-hmm. um, so even reviving those, those memories to compile a book that was, um, that flowed and yeah. that felt like you finally had your say what was the take like when I got each time you picked it up it wasn't like you were about to tell like a happily ever after story it was almost going from one situation soon as I thought it was going to be some leeway I'm like dang this happened too uh, <laughs> so what 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 was your emotional like day-to-day writing the book so I'll tell you what happened is um I have been talking and, and people have been saying write your book write your book when I started my business everybody's like oh the business is cool you booming mm-hmm. but write your book mm-hmm. um and so I was having a manic episode um and I was like I'm gonna finish my book mm-hmm. and then I got online and was like I have something for you guys come February 1st mm-hmm. and then I started writing for a couple of days. Um, I pulled out some of my old stuff because, you know, it had already been written years ago. Mm-hmm. I pulled out some of my old stuff, read through that. and was like, mm, I have a different perspective now. So I start writing, I start writing, mm-hmm. I start writing. And then about a week or so passed and I take a dip because it's the winter time. I have mm-hmm. seasonal depression. I have bipolar disorder. So I take a dip. Um, and as January, I'm going through January, I have my highs and I have my lows and my mm-hmm. best friend is calling like, Hey, get on your laptop. Mm-hmm. My boyfriend is coming home. Like, Hey, get on that laptop. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm just like, I don't, you know, like, I don't know. So I had some good days, some bad days. Uh, most days was crying and, and just a mess. And then two weeks before the deadline, I realized I was not finished. Mm-hmm. And the thought of me coming back to social media a second time with this book and it not being finished mm-hmm. just bothered me so bad it gave me anxiety and I was like yeah nope that gave me all the push I needed mm-hmm. that gave me all the push I needed to get through to the end but I I struggled I struggled um not only because I typically struggle around that time but just 
thinking of some of the things um, that I have been through, putting myself back into the hospital room with my mother, putting myself back into that space of having to explain how, you know, I stabbed this young lady, um, putting myself back into a lot of those scenarios was just, it was, it, it was tough. It was tough. I prayed a lot. I prayed, I prayed, I prayed. I would cry and I would pray, I would cry and I would pray. Then I finally found the strength and it was the day before I was going to release it. It was uh, January 31st and I called my auntie um, and I told her, I said, cause I was calling people asking them if they wanted uh, their names to be taken out of the book. Mm -hmm. So I called her and I said, listen, I wanna, um, you know, I included you in my book because, you know, um, I spent that one summer at your house mm -hmm. um, and you also introduced me to church. And that was a pivotal moment for me. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to, you know, I wanted you to know that I included you in that. And she said to me, um, I don't want to be a part of your book. I don't want you to name me in your book. I wish you would have told me you were writing a book because I understand you've been through a couple of things, but what you keep failing to realize when you want to tell your story is that you killed somebody. Mm -hmm. um, and that took everything out of me. Mm -hmm. It made me like, it made me afraid of what people were going to say. And you know, when people read the book, you will see that I'm heartfelt in the book. You know, my, it's not like the documentary. You know, I feel a little better. I explain it a little better. Um, and I really leave my feelings there, but it, it made me afraid. It really, really hurt my feelings. So then I wasn't going to do it. And then um, I had some people that really loved me and knew what the book meant to me, you know, and knew my heart that pushed me. Yeah. And what your aunt said, honestly, and I'm, and I don't want to offend you at all, but that is like a back, a thing in the back of your head when you read it. It's like when I read the book, and I was thinking, I was like, I hope people get what she's trying to tell you, like, and don't miss that moment. And they don't stop on that first like couple, of, you know, of how they got there. Because even for me, like I said, when I watched the documentary in my twenties. I was just like, oh, this girl, she's so young. She's so, like, you have a baby. You saw the same face, but your face was like, I mean, girl, <laughs> me high. you were so uh, tiny. Uh, and then mm -hmm. you were smart. You were very smart. Because even when it was a moment when like one of the, diver I don't know where he was. I'm just calling him a diversity guy. And he's trying to talk about these people. And you're like, no, if I'm looking like you can't base on my, I'm like, look at her. She's so smart. <laughs> so it's like, you almost want to just be like, well, not almost, but it's like our heart initially goes yeah. out to you like you just made a mistake but then as you get if you're talking to an adult and they probably have children they're looking at their kids and I'm like they like they can't get over that hump of like even seeing you being changed or even seeing all of the things that you had to go through even before this happened because from 12 up uh, from 12 years old going back to your birth that was enough of it. We didn't even need the rest of the story. That alone, right. that, those 12 years before any, any incident occurred after that, that was enough to be like, whoa, mm -hmm. like somebody needs to pull this whole family and just give them a fresh start because it was so much already that this situation was just like another big major blow, right? Yeah. So even when coming out with your book, I understood what she said, but I still feel like, and hopefully this is encouragement to you that somebody is going through that or somebody is going through that life when you just like, yo, everything is just messing with me, messing with me, messing with me. Or they're living the life and they feel like nothing is going to happen to them. There's not going to be a consequence. So I understand her, her point. And I feel like people are going to feel that way. It's going to be like, well, you took somebody's child. So we can never like sit down and be like, oh, you're cool because in their minds, they can't get past that. But at the same time, it's just like, if you want people to be saved, somebody had to go through something, right? And somebody yeah, had true. to do something so that they can, you know, tell that story on the other side. There's always two sides to that story. And I'm not yeah. taking away from the girl's life or her family or any of that. But in order for it to be some type of healing or something, we have to listen to you, right? And we have to yeah. listen to your story completely. Um, so while I understand that, I just encourage you to keep pushing forward. I know that was like way off base, but no. I get it. And I feel like people, you are going to meet more people who don't even know you to be like, yeah. well, you still did X, Y, and Z. Maybe this is just common, but I'm like, you can't look at that. You were 12. Yeah, I was, you <laughs> like, know, I was 12 and the situation was such a, 
it was it was just a different you know what not it wasn't a different situation it's a situation that kids find themselves in every single yes. day. and i'm like how many fights i've been in as a kid at 12 30, and i'm talking about they have been like blood is being shed oh. hair is being ripped out and it's like when i see your story that could have been me like yeah. each one of us fight how many fights do we have growing up and like even uh more recently i remember was a girl fighting in the bathroom and they they beat her up and then she hit her head on the um was it the sink or the toilet and they killed her yeah yeah I, don't, I remember and, that in my mind I'm not trying to be I don't believe even in their meanness that they went in it and they thought she was gonna die they yeah. wanted to just fight and but you don't that was the reason, at that age mm-hmm. that was the reason why I added that story because mm-hmm. to be honest I could have uh, you know I could have written the book and left it out it still would have been it still it, it still would have been a book you know what I mean but um just like I said in the book, I, I feel like there is something to take on both sides mm-hmm. from that story. I taught my children growing up um, about how to deal with conflict mm-hmm. um, without becoming violent because you just do not know. Mm-hmm. You know, you could feel like, oh, I'm going to here, I'm going to punch her in her face. And like you said, she could fall down somewhere, hit her head and die. Mm-hmm. You could feel like I'm going to go, I'm going I'm to trip her because I don't like her. She thinks she cute. Mm-hmm. That baby could be going through whatever at home and get up and slice you or shoot you. You know what I mean? We have to. And the it's crazy how that comes full circle. That goes back to the things that we learn when we're growing up, when it comes to discipline. Mm-hmm. See, that's one of the things that you put your children at risk of when all you know is physical discipline, because all they mm-hmm. know is that when you're not, when a person isn't doing what I want them to do, mm-hmm. or they're making me mad, I need to resort to violence because you didn't teach them any other skills because you had no other mm-hmm. skills, mm-hmm. you know, and that's where we're leading to all these situations with these young women. I was not the only young woman in that uh, facility with that charge. hmm and that's what there I was, was like, so- does anybody realize she walked into a room full of young girls? And I'm not saying they all have the same charge, but I'm just like, these are all but, people but, that- But a couple of them did. Wrong. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then you have you have the, my peers who are here saying, well, you shouldn't feel bad. I mean, girl, what you feel bad for? And mm-hmm. then you have adults who are saying, listen, you should feel bad. And mm-hmm. this is why you should feel bad. It was just such a, it was such a hard thing, you know? Mm-hmm. It was such a hard thing, but I don't, um, I don't regret adding it. Um, and I'm sure that there are people, I, I haven't run it and run into any besides my auntie yet, but I'm sure that there will be people who feel some type of way. And, um, I give them that right. Cause they do have that right. You know, I have children. I don't care what the, I don't care what my child was doing to you. Mm-hmm. I don't, I don't see myself being able to see you being no author or be on those stages mm-hmm. or have no type of notoriety after you took my child from this world. Mm-hmm. So I can understand that, you know, it's tough um, because the little girl in me still sometimes want to yell out. I didn't mean it, you know, like I was yeah. trying to, I was just, it wasn't my fault, you know, but the woman in me, the mother in me mm-hmm. has an understanding that that some, not everybody's going to feel like I have a right to the life I have right now. Yeah. So on a lighter note, who are some of the people that you can remember that really like saved your life? Because I mean, at certain points, I was just like, dang, she needs somebody to swoop in right there. And then you would keep reading and you got, um, what's her name? Uh, Miss Mimi? Am I saying her name right? Miss Mimi! Yeah, yes. Like certain people. And I was just like, she knew it. Like somebody, like somebody was praying for this girl. Somebody, God didn't let this girl go. And I'm like, mm-hmm. and I want to move into your spirituality too. Like, how did that help you? Because I remember when you got baptized, it was just such a, a, a thing. But who were some of the people who like, just like when you thought it was all lost, how did they like, they stepped in and if you don't mind naming them in like ways that they might have helped you yeah so miss mimi of course from catholic charities i mean she had nothing at all to gain um from mm-hmm. the things that she did for me just encouraging me you know asking me what i need nobody asked me what i needed mm-hmm. nobody not one person i mean this was after all that i have been through it wasn't one person that sat down and tried to understand you know like it just was literally all harsh just harsh all the time um so definitely miss Mimi my godmother Chanel has been um a force in my life and my mother was such a beautiful woman and a good friend 
um, that the women who she was good to, my father's ex-wife, um, my father's ex-girlfriend who he had children with, my godmother, um, my mother's best friend, they really swooped in um, as much as they could, you know, to try to help, to give me some encouraging words, to try to be there for me as much um, as they could. I, I wrote about my Aunt Tasha in the book. She's the one who came and got me from the yeah. shelter. My mother's best friend. Um, so yeah, it, it was just literally women that my mother left here on earth that she had given love to that returned the favor to me and my kids. All right. So what is Sinead doing right now? Like what what do people be like, okay, well, what is she doing right now? After the after the documentary stopped, like what has your life been like? I don't don't you don't have to give away the book, but just like right now, because like so many years passed yeah. and you're 30, you have your own children, your own love life, your own personal life. So how are you now? Um I'm amazing now. You know, I, I started a business that's almost two years old. Um, and that went well. That went well. I always knew I wanted to be an entrepreneur. Um, and yeah, I just started my business. It took off. So I, I recently went back to school to expand on that business to become a licensed esthetician. Um, so I could do some waxes and vajations and things like that. Um, my kids are growing up. They're graduating from high school and stuff, going to college empty in my pockets <laughs> are so I'm much like, <laughs> the ages I was like yeah that's sneakers clothes hair oh my gosh oh my gosh like they um they are amazing they deserve everything in the world but they definitely drain my pockets mm -hmm. um you know finally after I think my second book is just going to be about relationships mm -hmm. although I do have a a, mm -hmm. a, a a series um of short videos on TikTok called um the X Chronicles about all of my crazy relationship <laughs> stories but um you know I'm in a really healthy relationship I'm, I'm in a really healthy space you know I've been consistent with therapy um which took me a long time to do and um just living living and loving and um remaining positive yeah I like that your spirit seems very like lifted um yeah. one thing I wanted to know because you said this like you said you had mental health issues did they ever address that when you were younger did they ever diagnose that they tried to so my mother my you know I had gone to um have some evaluations when I was younger um the closest that they came to giving me a diagnosis came after I was arrested I must have been about 13 at the time and they had tried to um give me medication to uh what was it I think I may have been depressed or something like that they were trying to give me some medication to stable myself out my father um was like you yeah, know Mm -hmm. I feel you I, yeah. I understand because I think when you don't know exactly what's going on and nobody takes the time to explain anything and yeah. black people, especially black men's mind they like oh you ain't gonna poison my child mm -hmm. <laughs> like mm -hmm. you know they start hearing about you hear about all especially historically speaking black people yeah. and doctors and medicine it never really panned out so black yeah. men especially are very like fearful when it comes to like doctors treating you for something that, that they can't see like a cut or like a broken mm -hmm. bone so I understand where he was coming from. So how did you get to this place of knowing that you had mental health issues and then actually go into therapy and, you know, doing things to help you? So a friend of mine came to my house. So I have this thing um, in all of my houses. People, I, I think, I don't know, maybe people used to think I didn't have the money to decorate, but to me, I needed to keep everything plain. Mm -hmm. So for like, for instance, my walls are white, all my furniture is gray. I don't put anything on my walls and things like that, right? Mm -hmm. So what I would do is I would go through these spells or I would get depressed and then I would get happy again and I would give all the furniture away in my house and I would just keep doing that mm -hmm. um and one day a friend of mine came over older guy and he was like Nay where's your furniture and I was like oh I gave it away you know it kind of had me depressed I'm gonna get some more furniture and he was like you know you should probably go and get evaluated to see if you possibly have bipolar disorder um or something that's that's making you do that because I had done it so many times and sure enough you know like I was in therapy for maybe a year before they gave me the bipolar disorder um uh diagnosis but I originally had um anxiety so I have horrible anxiety and depression so yeah wow. that's how that came about yeah and when it comes to relationships how were you able to find healthy, healthy, healthy love? Like, how did you get there? Because you had, because you were in relationships so early, that's the kind of like the thing that stuck out to me the most. I was just like, well, 
every relationship that you were in progressively got, you know, more worse. <laughs> yeah, I didn't want to say it that way. I'm like, oh, no. I was trying to be like, I'm like, progressively, it just got a lot more worse. But it was like, it was so many extremes. It was just like from dating older guys, because I'm like, every time something would happen and I, I could see you clinging to like the love that they gave mm-hmm. me. I'm like, these are grown adult 20 something. And you're like 16. You were like, I was in love and I was 14. I'm like, he is in his, I'm like, girl, you know what I mean? So it's just like, when you've had such a, um, such a, uh, interactions with grown men and them like taking advantage of you in that way. Right. And then you went on to have something that was physically not well. How, how were you able to kind of like turn that around and say, you know what, this is what healthy love looks like. And this is what I want for myself when you didn't have the examples for so long. So I um, I had to first acknowledge the fact that I wasn't in a space where I could have even dealt with anyone who mm-hmm. was healthy to love me. Mm-hmm. Um, the one time that I did, you know, have someone who was healthy to love me, I, I was horrible. Um, so once I did some digging on myself, okay, why am I constantly attracting the cheater? Why am I constantly attracting the abuser? Why am I attracting this? And realize that I was literally a mirror. I was attracting some of those things that were inside of me. Mm-hmm. So I had to work on myself, you know, write down what it was that I really wanted mm-hmm. in a partner. Um, and then just be like, okay, well, you know, if you don't have this, I'm not willing to deal with it. Absolutely. And it doesn't have to be a, a materialistic thing, but like, mm-hmm. hey, if you can't communicate, I don't mm-hmm. have to that. Mm-hmm. If, if, if every time you get upset with me, you feel like you want to leave and, and you know, um, alienate me, I don't have any time for that type of stuff. Whereas though, years ago, when I was a bit younger, um, I just, I just, it was like, oh, okay, well, I'll deal with it. You know, I'll deal yeah. with it because it's a chance at love. And then eventually find myself getting so upset and so heartbroken that now I feel like I have to do something in return to hurt you. And it just was a, yeah, a cycle. continuous cycle. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah, it was a continuous cycle. I'm so glad you found, like I said, you feel you look lifted, like you don't look, you know, you look so lifted. Cause I, I mean, when you read the book, I promise you, I think if people don't know you, like I said, I've been following you for years and I'm like, she lives a healthy life, but I'm like, if people watch the documentary and they read the book, they'd be like, oh, dang, what is she doing? And it's like, you are vibrant, you are thriving, you are doing your thing. So last question is, what do you want people to take away from your story? Um, hope. Mm-hmm. you know um and resilience and grace for yourself um I think that's a big thing I think that a lot of what helped me back for so many years is not giving myself grace kind of feeling like I had to keep going I hate to keep going keep going I can't be sad I can't be down you know mm-hmm. Give yourself some grace, you know, feel what you feel, acknowledge those feelings because they are real. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, get your therapy on. I, 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 I say everybody should go to therapy because I feel like we all need it. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and just keep going. Every day when we wake up, we get another chance. You know, mm-hmm. if I thought about it, I have a million reasons to quit. But if I could just find one, I'm going to hold on to that one that's going to mm-hmm. give me a reason to keep going. Yeah. You know, a lot of it is about perspective. And when I was a teenager, I used to get up in the morning and listen to this song called uh, Happy Face by Destiny's Child. Yeah. So even if I didn't song. feel good, yes. by the time that was over, I was like, oh, okay. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. Yeah. That was good. So rapid questions real quick. All mm-hmm. right. What's your favorite time of day? Nighttime. Favorite television show? Oh man. So <laughs> it gotta be quick. Um, you gotta be quick. You can't think about it. Investigation dis- well, well, that's a channel. Uh <laughs> Evil Lives Here. Okay. Um pizza, I mean Coke or Pepsi? Coke. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Flying on planes or driving to like long destinations? Driving. Martin Luther King or Malcolm X? Malcolm X. What makes you happy? My family. And who is Shanae Watkins? A boss. I like that. All right. <laughs> well, tell, first of all, they need to go out and get the book. 
yeah girlhood to womanhood tell people where they can purchase it because you have published it independently so i want to make sure that they know where you they can purchase it and if and to follow you on social media yeah, so I am uh, Shanae Tamika. So that's Shanae, S-H-A-N-A-E, and then Tamika, T-A-M-I-K-A, on uh, Facebook and Instagram. The link for um, for the book, as well as my other business ventures, um, are in my bio. All right. Thank you so much, Shanae. Thank this you. was like the greatest thing ever. Like I said, this has been a long time coming for both of yeah. us. So thank you so much for taking the time out because I know you got things to do. Um, and this is great. This is great.